expected value. So this is what we expect to average in the long run with our sample. So if we take really, really large samples, what do we expect the sample mean to be? Well, in a nutshell, we expect that as we take larger and larger samples, the outcomes proportionately will match with what the population true probabilities are. So if you're supposed to get something 20% of the time in the population, because that's the probability of that event happening, with large samples, we expect to get really close to 20% of that outcome. So in the long run, we expect our average to be the average of the entire population. So here, when you're being asked to find the expected value, value of this lottery ticket, what it's really saying is, let's look at all the possible lottery ticket values. Let's look at the population of values okay, and find the mean of that population because that's what you expect your ticket to be worth on average in the long run, not the short run. Short run, anything can happen. Okay, so let's answer a few questions on our way to figuring out the expected value here. Okay, so we want to know first, in this particular lottery, right, it's a pick three lottery. You can choose from zero to nine, so that gives you 10 options for the first digit, 10 for the second, and 10 for the third digit. So that's 10 times 10 times 10, 1,000 different combinations of numbers. Or if you prefer, just think of it as an actual three digit number. Zero, zero, zero would be the smallest one, then zero, zero, one, zero, zero, two, all the way up to 999. So that's a thousand different combinations. So we have a thousand different combinations. We pay a dollar. If our combination comes up as the winner, then you win $500. So the probability of a ticket being a winner, well, if there's a thousand different combinations, only one of them is gonna be in the exact order. So the probability of being a winner is simply gonna be one in a thousand. All right, or if you prefer the decimal, that'd be 0 0.001. Now, I want you to notice that if there's a one in 1,000 chance you have the winner, that means there's a 999 out of 1,000 chance that your ticket's going to be a loser. Remember, losing and winning are complements from our probability that we've talked about earlier in the semester. All right, so the probability that you have a losing ticket is one minus the probability you have a winning ticket, which again is gonna be 0.999. Now the second question, how much is the ticket worth if you win? Well, if you have the winning ticket, you go up the window, they're gonna hand you $500 cash or a check or something equivalent. That doesn't mean the ticket was worth $500 to you, right? Because you had to pay a dollar to get that ticket, right? So it was a dollar out, $500 coming in. That means that ticket earns you $499. So that's what it's actually worth to you. So if you have a winning ticket, it's worth $499. How much does it worth to you if you have a losing ticket? Well, if you have a losing ticket, you paid a dollar and that dollar's gone and you got nothing back in return. So that ticket had a value of negative $1. So in this particular lottery, there's only two options. Your number comes up, and in that case, your bank account goes up $499, or you have a losing ticket, and your bank account goes down a dollar. So my variable X is the amount of cash that this lottery ticket is worth to me. There are only two options, $499 and negative one. That is a very, very small, but very clearly discrete population because there's lots of numbers in the world that exist between negative one and 499 that you can't get from this lottery ticket. When we first started looking at discrete populations, all right, we defined a random variable okay, to be a quantitative variable. That is the value right, of a sample of size one. So here we can talk about a lottery ticket and its value you know, prior to the lottery happening, when the outcome is still unknown and undetermined, that's our random variable. So X here represents the amount of money the ticket will be worth to you. Now, the expected value of a single ticket, 
right? is not, and I want to make this clear, it is not the most likely value. Right? So if we had to bet money on this, I would very much bet that you're going to lose your dollar because that's the most likely thing to happen. But that's not what we mean by the expected value of a single ticket. So when we talk about the expected value of a single ticket, that means our variable is the value of one ticket. And we want to know what is the average of that population. So each ticket has a whole entire population of possible values that it could end up being. And that population has an average. And that is our expected value. That is what we expect on average the tickets to be worth in the long run. So if we have really large samples, that's what's going to happen. So let's look at the math. Right? We're looking for the population mean. So we've done this several times now. It's just the weighted average of the values times the probabilities. Here we only have two values, 499 and negative 1. So I wouldn't bother using the calculator's one variable statistic shortcut that we just talked about a little while ago because it's not going to save us any time. Right? Just use the definition. So our first value was $499. That's if you get a winning ticket. And the probability of that happening is 0 0.001. We're going to add to that or sum up right, the next possible value, which is negative 1. That is, you lose your dollar. And that's going to happen 999 times out of 1,000. So on average, we end up with a negative 50 cents. So notice here, this takes into account, yes, there's a chance of winning $499. Yes, there's a chance of losing a dollar. And it accounts for the fact that the $499 rarely happens and the negative one happens most of the time. So if you were to buy one lottery ticket, drawing after drawing, week after week after week, day after day, every time there's a lottery, you take and buy one ticket and you do this tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of different drawings, on average, you would lose 50 cents per ticket. And you're never going to lose 50 cents on one ticket. Right? You can only lose a dollar or gain 4.99, but on average, that's going to average out to losing 50 cents a ticket. Now, Tennessee also has a cash four lottery, played the same way, except for there's four numbers. So four digits which means there are 10,000 different combinations and only one of them will be the winner. So your chances of winning cash four are way lower than they were with cash three, which means the lottery has to pay you more money to entice you to buy this ticket. But it turns out if we did the expected value for the cash four lottery, it is also negative 50 cents. So is the cash four lottery a better investment strategy than the cash three lottery? In both cases, what's going to happen? You're going to lose 50 cents per ticket. Right? So in each lottery, when you lose, you'll lose a dollar. That's the way they work. In the cash four lottery, when you win, you'll win much more than the $499, but it happens much more rarely than you'd win the cash three lottery. But on average, both lotteries are going to cost you 50 cents per ticket. So no, cash four is not a better strategy, but it's also not a worse strategy in terms of investment. In either case, you expect to lose 50 cents per ticket. So if you bought 100,000 tickets, so one ticket for 100,000 different drawings, you would expect to lose 50 cents per ticket. So you would expect for those 100,000 tickets, you would lose $50,000. All right, so now here, I want you to take and find the expected value of this life insurance policy. And so we're given the probability that the selected 40-year-old male will live through the next year, which means you also know the probability that he will not live through the next year. The policy is a $500,000 policy, okay, which means if this 40-year-old dies within the year that the policy is in place, Someone will get a check for $500,000, okay, so his estate. Now, in order to secure this $500,000 policy, the premium is $1,100. So insurance is similar to the lottery from the standpoint of you have to pay the money up front. So 
keep track. You pay the money up front, $1,100 goes out of the account. And then over the course of the next year, this person either lives or dies. And so I want you to figure out what the possible values are, what the expected value of the policy will be, and based on what you figured out that expected value is in part B, does the insurance company expect to make a profit? So here, I want you to pause the video and I want you to try this one for yourself. All right, so hopefully you've gone through this and you figured all the pieces out, but we're gonna go over it together now just to make sure. So from the perspective of the 40 year old male, what are the possible values of the policy? Well, he could live, and if he lives, then he's out the $1,100, so this policy was actually worth negative $1,100. Now, if he dies, his estate gets a check for $500,000. We have to take out the $1,100 that were paid. So if he dies, the policy was actually worth $498,900. Now we know the probability of living was given to us as 0.9979. So if we subtract that from one, we have the probability that he dies. So to find the expected value, which again is equal to the mean, we're simply gonna find the weighted average. So we take the negative $1,100 times the probability that he lives to lose that money plus the $498,900 times the probability that someone gains that money for his estate. And that averages out to be negative $50. So to be clear, we're not saying that the most likely value of the policy is negative $50 because negative $50 is not an option for this policy. Right, the most likely thing to have happen is that this policy will be worth negative $1,100 to the 40 year old male who bought it. And, and because life insurance only stays in place for you know, a period, so in this case, a one year period while he's 40 years old, when he turns 41, it'll be a different policy. So in this case, this male is not gonna have a long run. He's not gonna buy you know, policy after policy after policy for hundreds of thousands, millions of policies, because he's going to be 40 years old once. So the long run here is not going to be the same male buying it over and over, but instead having a large group of 40 year old males and having each one of them buy the policy because then they become the long run. Now you're asked in part C, Right. Based on what we just found, does the insurance company expect to make a profit? Well, we just figured out that if you're the one who bought the policy, you expect to lose $50. Who are you going to lose it to? The insurance company, of course. Now, that means they're going to make $50 per policy on average in the long run. And I cannot stress this enough. In the long run. So they need, they need to sell hundreds of thousands of policies, all right? That way they get a long run and that way they can, on average, make this $50 per policy. In the short run, anything is possible. If the company only sells 10 policies, you get someone dying right away, the company goes out of business because they didn't make their average of $50, right? The short run in probability, the short run is random. In the long run, we're talking large samples, large, 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 huge samples. In the long run, our samples proportionately will match the population. And therefore, the average of our really large samples will be very, very close to the average of the entire population. So let's look at another example here. Ed's Marina rents houseboats. They have one day, three day, and seven day rental contracts. We're given the percentage of the rentals that last for each length. And we're asked, what is the expected length of the rental agreement? So this is telling me that my variable X is the length of the agreement. 
So when it says find the expected length, it's saying find the expected value of your length x. So this is the same as what we've been doing. Okay, so I'm gonna have you do this problem. I'm gonna highly suggest that the first thing you do is create a table version of this paragraph. So like we have been, one column has your actual values in it, x's, and the other has the corresponding probabilities. Then find your expected value, right? And then we'll talk about what it means. So, pause and practice. Pause the video, try this problem on your own, and then I'm gonna walk you through and make sure everything went okay. So this should be what your table looks like. Again, the x values are 1, 3, and 7. The probability of lasting one day was 0.23 since 23% of rentals were for one day, and so on. Now, before we go any further, I want to pause and make sure we've done everything correctly. 1, 3, and 7. The length of the contract. Is that a discrete population? Are there numbers that exist between 1 and 3 and 3 and 7 that are not possible for the length of these contracts? Yes. So this is definitely discrete. Now those probabilities, they're all legal. They're all between 0 and 1. Do they add up to 1? Did you even check to see if they added up to 1? So they do, in fact, add up to 1. All right. That means we do have here a legal description of our probability distribution. So therefore, when we want to find the expected length of the rental agreement, we can simply find the population mean. And because we have a legitimate description of a discrete population and its distribution, we can use this formula. Right? That mu equals the sum of the x times p of x, that doesn't mean anything if your population is not discrete. Okay? So here we're going to do the 1, 3, and 7 multiplied by their corresponding probabilities. Add those all up and we get 3.94 days. So, I want you to write down exactly what that 3.94 days is. So, if you need to pause the video, go right ahead. So, how do we interpret the 3.49 days? That's what I'm asking you. Three point nine four days. That's our expected length of the rental agreement. That is, if we take large samples, this is what we expect to have happen on average. So more often than not, Ed is going to rent out the houseboats for three days. Okay. A lot of times, seven days. Not as often for one day. But on average, if he has rental after rental after rental after rental after rental, on average, we expect the length of the agreement to be for 3.94 days. If you have any questions about the topics covered in this video or anything else that's happening in your statistical reasoning class, talk to your instructor, go to their office hours, or take advantage of the free tutoring available in the Math Tutorial Center. Good luck and go Vols!